Greetings, ladies and mantelgents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. Just a quick note, I know this might be getting a bit long in the tooth, but trust me, it'll end soon. I've created an additional channel specifically for series. All the series from this channel will be moved to that channel. If you are so inclined, there will be a link in the description, and you can head over there and tick a box, and you'll get notified when there are new series. Thank you very much. Anyways, on to the story. Utopia Prime, written by Echoing Cascade. 2349. An Imorak businessman was waiting on the news of his latest venture, the colonization of the newly discovered garden world. The planet was several times larger than any other planet given its ecosystem, and it was expected to bring him a tidy profit. The small grey alien was sitting at his desk, wondering why his secretary was late with the report, and when the door finally opened, it was the Mysoran Imros that entered instead. The man looked sheepish, quite an accomplishment coming from a seven feet tall reptilian bundle of muscles. Uh, the omission failed. 2349 wanted to yell, if only to air his frustrations, but something in the way the Mysoran spoke bothered him. He looked frightened. Is there something wrong with the planet? Oh, yes. What did the survey teams find? Uh, nothing. We weren't able to land any. 2349 was confused. Granted, if it was too cold, the reptilian Mysorans couldn't land on it without special equipment. The Amorak required levitation belts to move in higher gravities, and Aeons couldn't deal with anything having too strong a psychic field. But they had humans with them. The Death Worlders may be a pain in the, well everywhere to maintain, but they were supremely adaptable to hostile environments. Even the humans, uh, they were the ones who first noticed something was wrong. Allow me to show you the field report. Two weeks ago, in orbit on the temporarily named planet Utopia Prime, Captain Pierce was going over the data while preparing his team for the initial incursion. Stable temperature, low winds, lush forests, no fauna and no geological dangers. Yep. It's a garden world, all right. The man had fought in the Corporation Wars and was scheduling the first recon. He would lead it personally. Normally, such an easy assignment would be left to newer members of the team. But something felt off. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I didn't make it this far by ignoring my instincts. Maleskis, Hoffman, get your full nuclear biological chemical armor. Oh, we are also taking Fluffy for a walk. The two former rangers nodded and went to get their gear. Loading Fluffy, the eight feet long, 500 pound Fenra class bioengineered combat wolf, was surprisingly difficult. The moment he set foot, or rather paw, on the shuttle, he became agitated. Fluffy feels it too. There is something wrong. Velasquez and Hoffman haven't said anything but a quick look at their vitals, show the heart rate is well above normal. Landing in five minutes. The shuttle AI chimed the message, and on cue, Fluffy began to fight his restraints. Hoffman tried to soothe the beast, but it kept trying to tear at its collar, drawing blood in the process. Trank him, yelled Velasquez, as he moved in to immobilize the wolf so Hoffman could get into medkit. By the time they landed, the beast was sleeping, and Hoffman was applying a dressing to its wound. What the hell was that? Fluffy is a combat wolf for frack's sakes, trained to follow orders in active battlefield. What the hell has it spooked? No one had the time to answer Velasquez as the shuttle door opened and all three turned their guns towards the descending ramp. Captain Pierce took point and the two remaining rangers covered the exit as he slowly made his way off the shuttle. All right, some lush forest, nice weather, no signs of fauna. One more step and then... The captain never completed the motion. Before his foot touched the cross, he rolled backwards into the shuttle. Hoffman and Velasquez opened fire on the forest in general. Close the doors! Close the doors! 2349 was watching the video report of Captain Pierce. We returned to the exploration vessel the second those doors were sealed. The man looked shaken in the way that 2349 had never seen before. He seemed on the edge of hysterics. I have willingly stepped into enemy kill zones to buy time for the rest of my company. Held the line when artillery was going to rain death on our position, but... Uh, that... that was worse. The human took a swig of what to 2349 looked like a lethal amount of alcohol before continuing. Imagine, 
Imagine walking on your grave, but it's also you doing the stepping, and instead of it being unsettling or terrifying, it was a euphoric occasion. Like, I was happily crushing my own corpse, joyfully killing myself. He had his head in his hands, sweating profusely. I have no idea what the frack is in that planet, but no one should go there. Emros turned off the recording. After that, we tried to analyze the feed from the planet in more detail. He brought up an image into 2349's presentation screen. A beautiful sunny forest. Do you see something wrong? 2349 didn't notice anything strange. Not really. Well, well, maybe. Emros nodded. Something feels odd, right? It took us a while to figure it out ourselves. Not all the shadows are where they should be. Some of the leaves don't sway in the wind, and there is the sun. What about the sun? It never sets. In the weeks we observed the planet, the image received from the probe never changed in luminosity. 2349 felt a chill down his spine. He was going to ask a question when an odd noise caught his ears. It seemed to be coming from the video, so he began to increase the volume. He was almost there when he was startled by M. Ross putting a hand on his shoulder. It never becomes audible. 2349 didn't recall Emros getting up from his chair or how long he had been trying to fix the audio. When he checked the sound output, it was at over 1,000%. What the hell is it? Emros turned the volume off and returned to where he was sitting. We had an iron psychic check it. He translated it to the monarch in gold-colored robes. Doesn't ring a bell, the Imarak uttered the human expression before remembering the Mysoran may not understand it. He was about to correct himself when Emros cut him off. I did to the humans. The king in yellow was known to them. They called the nearest Terran fleet, which sent a dreadnought to crack the planet to pieces. They destroyed the whole planet? The Mysoran nodded, clearly shaking. They said that it couldn't afford to take chances, and then they posted several automated combat stations around the debris field. Why would they do that? Emros pointed to the image on the presentation screen. Because, sir... Uh, that isn't a recording, uh. it's a live feed. End of story. Story number two. Trap, Trap, written by Echoing Cascade. One shot. Ramke, Lord General of the Solus Empire, had called the senior members of the War Council to discuss a troubling message from the Terran Alliance received earlier that day. Emperor Solusar the Sixth. Ashito, Minister of Propaganda, and Torin, the Unkillable, read the message in turn from an old-fashioned paper scroll. Emperor, what do you think, General? The General responded post haste. Part of me thinks it's a trap, Your Grace. Minister, and the other part, General. The other part knows that a fracking fact that it's a trap. The Emperor nodded and looked at his minister. Emperor. What is the situation on the front? How goes the fighting on Solus IV? Aye, thanks to the courage and ceaseless vigilance of the troops of the 624th, we still hold the beachhead from which to counteroffensive will. Torrin the Unkillable snorted, lifting his head from a book that he was now reading, and raised an eyebrow at the minister. The only reason we still have troops there is that the humans shot down anything with wings up to and including birds, the soldiers haven't surrendered because they can't seem to remember what colors to present, and no one wants to risk their life on it being purple. There, are you happy? The general locked eyes with the minister and surreptitiously pointed to the emperor. The minister turned pale and was about to apologize when the emperor cut him off. We don't have time, for niceties. Torin, what do you think of this message? Torin was the hero of the Solus Terran War. He successfully led several campaigns against the Death Worlders, and had scars to prove it. You could drop a tick into the labyrinth of cuts that was his face, and it would likely never make it out. Cyrano de Bergerac, Q de Devoux, set in a chou, Girasse, male, new survivor, patriarchal, patriarchal de succès, nun, nun, sabien, prabula, losc est internatal. Everyone blinked in confusion for a few seconds, but before anyone could ask what the hell he just said, he spoke up again. It's an old human and roughly translates to, uh, what you say? Pointless. I know it well, but one does not fight in the hopes of victory. Nay, this far more glorious when it is meaningless. It is from this book I took from a soldier who charged at my squad with nothing but a knife. 
He waved the book in his hand, and the minister grinned. Ha! Huh, what did he hope to achieve by doing that? Torrin put the book on the table and nailed the minister with his chair with a glare. I don't know what he was trying to achieve, but what I do know is that he stabbed three members of my squad before he died, including my commanding officer. No one shot at him? The minister's words were little more than a whisper. Oh, we shot at him, all right. But you see, death world is made of different stuff. They may not be stronger, faster, or smarter, but they are far more stubborn than us. The emperor and minister seemed confused by the statement, while the general nodded in agreement. Stubborn? Quite so. When the average sentient being receives a mortal wound, they simply drop dead, while a human will continue to fight and only die when they are good and ready. The emperor looked frightened. Don't get me wrong, they are not all like that. Most die when killed, but not a negligible percentage of them seem to regard death as something that can wait. What do you propose? I only see one way to regain the initiative. All Lord Cinerillus entered the office of General Armstrong at a brisk pace. The news of the ceasefire negotiations that were to take place in Solace Four had appeared out of nowhere, and he wanted answers. Cinerillus waited for the General Secretary to leave the room before waving his data pad. The frack! Uh, I sent a message to their high command this morning. This was their answer. The hell did you tell them? The general searched for the message on his desk computer and put the message on the screen behind him. We surrender. Negotiations to take place on Earth. Piesa, bring your own wine. Two weeks later, during the peace talks, Warlord Cyrillus sported a bandaged chest, most assumed from battle wound, but a few knew that it was from a cracked rib due to excessive laughter. End of story. There is a new legend on the horizon. Blueberry Cat has taken the T6 Patreon spot. Thank you very much, and I am sure that I speak for everyone when I say that. I would just like to thank our T5 members, Lord Azrakal, Ambrose Cattell, Quantum Wednesday, Dregzoon WRE, Blueberry Cat, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Bushmaster 177, and Leslie 517. Thank you very much.